Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Geography 2050, Towards a More Equitable Future, an event by the American Geographical Society. Today, we have a distinguished panel convened to discuss the topic of building inclusive cities. I'm very excited that we have folks from the public, private, um, and nonprofit sectors all here today to share their work um, at the front edge of what it takes in order to build more cities that work for more people. I'm Tracy Haddon Lowe, and I'm a fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Today, I'll be joined by Carolyn M. Crockett, the Chief Equity Officer for the City of Boston, Kate Chin, the Head of Community and Civic Engagement for Alliance Bernstein, Liz Williams, Director of Data and Policy for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, and Sharon Owens, the Deputy Mayor of Syracuse, New York. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me here today. I've asked each of our panelists to introduce themselves to you by answering three questions about themselves. First, who are they? Second, what do they do? And third, what motivates them to do the work that they do to build inclusive cities? So now we're gonna take a moment to learn a little bit more about each other before we get to our discussion. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Carolyn. Thank you, Tracy. It is so wonderful to be here um, for this convening and a part of this incredibly distinguished panel. So uh, delighted for the conversation. So I am um, excited to be able to talk about the role that I had as the chief of equity for the, for the city of Boston. I was the inaugural uh, chief of equity for the city and am now uh, back firmly uh, nestled into MIT where I'm a professor of urban planning, policy, and history. But I come to you today as a granddaughter, as an ethnographer, historian, and resident. This is a picture of my family, a couple different generations of, of my family. In fact, I'm, I'm sitting in the middle of, of this image of my uh, graduation day uh, so many years back, more than 25 years ago now. Um, but it is, it's a story of, of my family's own journey uh, to uh, to Boston, to Massachusetts, having been uh, coal miners in West Virginia. So you see me sitting there uh, next to my uncle Frank, and um, on your left is my is my grandmother in a red jacket. I was just so proud. She's looking beautiful. Uh, the, the woman that raised me, the daughter herself of coal miners, and so my story is very much a, a story like so many um, African American Southerners who moved to the North. Uh, in search of, of, of economic opportunity and trying to understand a story that's so much bigger than all of us. And so um, that has absolutely formed me personally and professionally, has led me into the academy, uh, has led me into government, and has led me to ask really, I hope, hard-hitting questions about collective action, about struggle, what does it mean to recover from an extractive economy, as my family did in, in West Virginia, what does it mean to flee uh, racial terrorism of the, of the town where they lived and to try to understand what that means in the North in terms of racial restoration, restoration and justice. And what does it mean to enact and call into being spatial justice? And so my family is just one of many families trying to figure this out. And I'm just so delighted to be in conversation with uh, my sisters and comrades in arms today. So much of my work is really animated uh, by this story around action, uh, collective action, organizing. Uh, my family leaves West Virginia in the 1950s and comes to Boston in hope of prosperity, in hopes of greater educational and economic opportunity. And they did not in fact find that here. Uh, my grandmother who, who you saw in that previous photograph was one of the original plaintiffs in the Tallulah Morgan case, which was a, a landmark case here in Boston in 1974, where black mothers and their children sued the school committee to integrate schools. Uh, so many of you know the, the, the infamous Boston, Boston busing story and all those images that were splayed across the country. My family was right there in ground zero, at ground zero in this fight. And so, so much of that has to do with transformation, not only in the educational 
personal space, but in the economic space and how we think about opportunity. This has been uh, instrumental and definitive for my own scholarly work. Uh, on faculty at MIT, I have launched a project called Hacking the Archive that it engages residents, organizers, policymakers, um, and advocates in the investigations of um, defining social movement battles on the ground and what that has meant for transforming the neighborhoods of Boston and also uh, the policy agenda of elected officials at all levels. And so what you see in front of you is an image of Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, uh, and a few dotted lines in the middle of the screen. And so in 1960s, in the 1960s moment, there was an effort to expand I-95 as part of the federal interstate system and to bring the heart of I-95 right into the heart of Boston. Uh, a very powerful coalition of planners, of clergy, of activists and black nationalists came together and said no. In fact, they said hell no, and were very successful and were ultimately successful in stopping this movement uh, of, of roads. And so what we, uh, what we received uh, is an invisible uh, monument, an invisible story of what did not happen. And this process, this project that I'm engaged in called Hacking the Archive is all about going into archives and searching them for the stories that they don't tell and inserting new activist possibilities of determination uh, and fight and visions for urban future and bringing those stories to bear on current movements, movements around transportation, around housing, around jobs, uh, and about really trying to understand the outer limit of racial liberation and justice. And so uh, really delighted to think about the ways that our own stories, our own witness, uh, can in interface and are defined uh, and also transgress the confines of policy and how to put that into the hands of activists, folks, uh, families that are on the ground right, right now fighting for battles that had been historic but are still very much front and center in terms of what we're fighting for right now. So I'll pause there in terms of what, what I've been up to, but really just want to finish with this final image that talks about the project and talks about really engaging in exploratory uh, coalitions, again, of activists, of students, of residents. We were able to bring people together for a hackathon in 2019. This work continues by bringing activists and archivists, archivists from local uh, universities, including MIT, including Northeastern University, uh, Suffolk University, uh, Harvard, uh, UMass Boston and others, really to bring folks to the table with their documents and to say, how can we mine the past and how can we allow this current generation to be right in the front of that discussion, not only examining history um, and asking questions again about the past, but using that very much as a way to build new strategies, new networks for fighting on the ground for spatial justice today. So there's an incredible amount of promise and opportunity here, particularly when we are trying to work beyond the university's bounds and bring that to the street, which is very much um, what's needed um, and very much the work that, that centers me and guides me every day. Wow, Carolyn, thanks so much for that. Okay, next up is Kate. Hi, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here with this, uh, this very distinguished panel. Um, my name is Kate Chen. I am the head of community and civic engagement at Alliance Bernstein. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I was actually raised in Nashville, Tennessee. I spent 16 years in New York City before I returned home in 2015. Uh, and when I did come home, I came home to a very different city than I had left in 1999. Nashville, as you have probably heard, um, has been going through incredible growth uh, in the last 10 to 15 years. And in fact, in, since, 20, since 2009, it has seen over a 22% increase in its residents. Um, so not only that, but the Wall Street Journal just ranked it as the number two hottest job market in the U.S. So there is no sign of this slowing down. Um, all of that said, when I, when I returned home and I, I had this opportunity to work at the Chamber of Commerce, um, it gave me the opportunity really to learn more about the new challenges that Nashville was facing as it 
was growing so rapidly. Um, and that positioned me very well when Alliance Bernstein announced that they were moving their corporate headquarters from New York City to Nashville in 2018 to take that position as the head of their community engagement. Um, my, my role primarily focused in 2019 in that first phase, um, it focused on building our presence in Nashville. Um, Nashville is a, a much smaller and civically minded city um, than New York. And because of that, AB really wanted to make sure that we had an intentional plan around how we were gonna engage with the community. So we spent a, a lot of time focusing on Nashville's needs, trying to understand what those needs were, looking at our own set of values as a company and how those values intersected with the needs in Nashville, and then really where we could actually make an impact. Um, and so that's kind of the way we entered. I'm happy to say that after three, uh, about three years um, of this work, we have expanded that program globally and now have four programs running uh, in Asia, London, New York, and Nashville, and they're all based on the model that we created in Nashville when we moved the headquarters. So you can go to the next slide, Tracy. Um, a little bit about AB. Um, Alliance Bernstein, if it's new to you, is a global asset management firm. We have um, almost $700 billion in assets under management. We uh, we manage investments for institutional clients and private wealth clients um, all over the world. So it was a surprise to a lot of people when uh, AB announced that they had decided to move their headquarters because it seems like a very New York centric firm. We do still have a large presence in New York, um, hence the, the New York grants program I just mentioned, but Nashville has really been our focus because it's, it's our new home. Um, so, how are we working to make Nashville a more inclusive city? Well, after we did, we conducted sort of a listening tour. Uh, as I mentioned in 2019, we really ha had a lot of community meetings, meetings with nonprofits, and had a lot of internal meetings as well to figure out what should we be focused on? How can we make a real difference? And education rose to the top as one of the most clear needs in Nashville and also something where we felt like it was just um, uh, it just intersected so nicely with our value set and, and our desire to help people um, make the most of their lives and help them set them up for success in life, both through investments and, and hopefully through this community engagement work. Um, we already, I should also mention, we already had a very strong diversity and inclusion team in place. And I leaned heavily on that team. And now actually I am part of that team. We have joined forces. So all the decisions we make are made uh, with a diversity and inclusion lens and with an equity lens. So we're trying not just to, uh, you know, we want to support the community, but we particularly want to support the underserved parts of the community. And that's how we view any investment in the community that we make. We use this model that has been, has worked beautifully for us. Uh, we call it the OR model, O-R-E, observe, reflect, engage. So our first step is to observe and listen to the community. Our next step is to think about that and how that fits in with AB and our values and what we have to offer. And then finally, we engage. We, we take action, we make investments, we give our time, we give our resources. So you can go to the next slide. So um, finally, I, I just thought it would be interesting to share a map and you ask what motivates you. And I think um, looking at this on the left, you'll see a redlining map of Nashville. This is the city of Nashville uh, in the 1930s and the red zones were marked hazardous for lenders. And you can see on the right, a current map that identifies the locations of the lowest performing schools in Nashville. And I don't even need to say, it just directly correlates. Um, so when we look at that, and we see that the inequities of the past have followed us into today. Um, I, I think it, it really motivates us to go geographically into these areas and, and focus our efforts on the specific neighborhoods that need help the most, which is exactly what we have done. We've partnered with nonprofits that serve North Nashville. We've partnered with nonprofits that serve Antioch, which is that Southern portion. And then East Nashville, Martha O'Brien Center is located right there. So whether we knew it or not at the beginning, we were geographically 
targeting areas to help them um, become better. Uh, so I just thought that would be an interesting way to illustrate uh, how we think about that community engagement. And I'll stop there. So much for that. I mean, really powerful images here. And now I'm going to hand it over to Liz. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Um, well, as you introduced me, um, my name is Liz Williams. I am the Director of Data and Policy in the Office of Transportation Planning at the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. So Carolyn and I are coming from probably just down the road from each other right now. Um, so in answer to the, the questions that you posed to us to sort of introduce ourselves, um, you know, one of the things you asked was, who are we and, and what is our connection to cities? Um, I'm trained as a sociologist, as an urban sociologist. I have never taken a transportation planning or policy class in my entire life. But I think that that my training and my background gives me a sort of unique perspective. Because what is an urban sociologist? But an urban sociologist is someone who takes as a point of departure in their work the fact or the concept that place matters, that not only do we matter to our places, but it's a recognition that we shape our environment, that the way that things look is a product of decisions that have been made about it, and that places matter to us, that where we grow up and where we live and the things that we can or cannot do have fundamentally shaped who we all are. Communities um, and outcomes, all types of social and personal and community-based lived experiences, these are all tied to places, the physical places and our intangible sense of them. I'm also a data person, which means that, among other things, that I care very much about the quality of my observations, the, the, the validity and the reliability of the things that I, the things that I see and, and the patterns that I'm, I'm looking at um, and the biases and the limitations of that data itself. My job puts me in a position to have access to and look at a lot of data every day that helps tell stories about transportation planning. I actively work in a transportation planning office. Um, like many others on the panel today, uh, I think there's growing recognition in all of our industries that the way that our work has been oriented for most of its history has left a lot on the table in terms of efficiency and success. And in fact, acknowledgement of, of the very issues that we've actually brought to bear on people. Transportation is fundamental, but it's often overlooked or taken for granted in terms of its mutability and its pliability in shaping those outcomes and the experiences that have been problematic for so many people. Um, so next slide. So one other thing you asked us to talk about was what does building, as in building an inclusive city, mean to us? And for me, coming off of everything I've just sort of told you about myself and my work, for me, it means access. Um, it means enabling people to get to the places that they want to go, to access the opportunities that they want to, to see. Um, that's what drives us. And in my profession, historically, we measure success of the transportation network in terms of travel time. How long does it take you to get between places? It also means that we incentivize people to build cities and roads and transit services and other urban infrastructure to move people through the network quickly with little delay, especially in Boston. Congestion is enemy number one. And so what that means is that we take any threats to, to free flow or the ease of movement and we zap them. Not just engineering and design elements of the roadway, but the elements of the community that would slow traffic. A pedestrian crosswalk, for example. Um, a transit stop. Retail, restaurants or movie theaters. Apartment buildings. Central business districts. Any kind of transit-oriented development. Anything that could potentially slow down traffic or mobility is considered a bad thing. And anything designed to speed it up is a good thing. Obviously, this completely ignores the purpose of the network itself, which is to get people to destinations. Those places matter. Those retail stops, those transit stops matter. It's not just about people's movement through the system, but in my industry, we're starting to consider, at, at, you know, long last, the entire trip, where you're starting from, um, where you're going to. So it's not just about the movement. The photo on the left is... Uh, Rochester, New York. It's not Syracuse. Um, as you can see, uh, you can go as fast as you want down that corridor. And you'll probably want to because it, there's nothing going on there. There's nothing to do. 
there are no opportunities, there's no attraction. Why would people want to go there? But this is actually how we encourage cities to be built, uh, how transportation to be sort of introduced. Uh, not to mention that this is the transportation that often bifurcates neighborhoods and rips out the best part of the cities. Uh, the photo on the right, on the other hand, is New Orleans. And you're probably not going to go as fast down this road as you possibly could, but you probably don't want to either, right? Because there's things you want to do there. There's places you want to stop, people to see and things to do. But according to current metrics of urban transportation planning, this is a total disaster, believe it or not. Next slide. So what does inclusive mean? What does inclusive look like? Coming off of that concept of the significance of transportation planning, it's not about mobility. It's about accessibility. It's about people reaching the things that they want to do. Inclusive to me means access. It means that people can go and do the things that they want. And it's not a big deal. It's not a chore. The initial decisions of the getting there part don't take more than 10 seconds. And the execution of the getting there part is safe. It's easy. It's reliable. And it's convenient no matter what mode you choose. It's not open to one group of people or another. And I'm especially thinking of now of, of ADA and people with limited mobility options, of course, as well. An inclusive city means one that provides literal and figurative pathways for people to get there, wherever that there is. And inclusive also means we need to change up community engagement. It's almost cliche in our industry, but bringing people to the table and giving people a seat at the table just doesn't fly anymore. We need to actually get away from the table. We need to get out of the room. Public engagement doesn't mean putting on a town hall. It doesn't mean going out and putting flyers up places. It means going out and meeting people where they're at, not expecting them to take time away to be part of that public process. But we take our time and we go to them because that's what our job is. So the images on this slide are ones that I've taken from... Lynn, Massachusetts, where MassDOT has worked with the city and local organizations and regional stakeholders to develop something called the Lynn for Safe Streets for People playbook, where it's, it's a really engaging site. People can get information about all kinds of multimodal projects happening in this city. It's been a collaborative effort with people um, at the municipal level and through many community-based organizations. Um, and I think it really is the future for our transportation planning at MassDOT, which I hope um, will help us all lead to more inclusive cities. So that's that's it for me right now. Thank you, Tracy. Very, very cool. Very exciting. And last but definitely not least, <laughs> Deputy Mayor Sharon Owens, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Tracy. And uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, as you introduced earlier, I'm the Deputy Mayor of the City of Syracuse. Uh, I am an adopted daughter of Syracuse for over 30 years. Um, my um, Origin is in the beautiful Finger Lakes region, and I came uh, just east of that area to come to Syracuse University uh, and uh, met um, what happens to everyone from Syracuse University, some amazing people in Syracuse, and you marry them or you plant roots with them, and then you're here for um, now for me over 30 years, and it was the best decision I've ever made. Uh, and my pathway to now started in neighborhood-based community engagement and service provision. I have worked for over 30 years in neighborhood-based community centers, um, um, uh, programming to provide the services for our families to help them be healthy and happy and whole, um, starting with, you know, it, it, in my origins in Head Start, working in Head Start and working with those young women and their young children and realizing um, working with them, they were making personal decisions about changing the trajectory of their life, whether that was going back to school or getting career development. But the environment around them wasn't keeping up with the personal decision they were making for themselves. And so I, I realized then that I had to be in a position where I can impact how they live, where they live, and how they work and play. And so that began the transition of my life through community engagement, housing development, neighborhood planning, um, and, and now the second time around in municipal government. Next slide. So I'm responsible for the oversight of the city's police, fire, housing, and business development departments. I see my role as I am the person who's overseeing and ensuring that we are providing um, the best opportunities for our residents, for the way people live and play and feel in our city. Um, my counterpart is the infrastructure, the water, the roads, all of that. I'm the people person and how we engage with people in our city. Um, and, and so it impacts 
their neighborhoods and how they live and how they conduct their business. And uh, building is the culmination for me of multiple parts that make a whole. Uh, you don't have a complete building capacity unless you're bringing, as uh, Liz said, throwing out the table, tearing up the door off the hinges and getting out to people and engaging them where they are, how they live and what they aspire to be for themselves, their family and their community and being real and perfect purposeful about how we're going to um, uh, adapt and make a change there. So all parts are important to growth. Next slide, please. And so you're going to see a slideshow on the side of you about what may, motivates me right now in my role is the slides that you're going to see there about the 15th ward of the city of Syracuse and how it was a vibrant community of um, multiracial, multiethnic businesses and residences. And then urban planning came in and just like Liz talked about, a highway was built. And that highway tore that neighborhood apart. And now the individuals that live in that neighborhood now live right next to that monstrosity you're looking at right now. And we have been fighting in this community for 10 years to take that thing down. And so I'm motivated because I've seen over 30 years that intentional positive intervention in the lives of people re result in transformational moments in time. When that highway was erected, that was a transformational moment in time. It was intentional, but it was not positive. And Webster's defines inclusion as increase or addition. So inclusion increases or adds one thing and makes it better. And if we're not um, providing um, something and adding to something to make it better, then it is not inclusion. And it requires opening or an entrance in order to influence um, circumstances and outcomes. It requires intentional action. What may, motivates me, next slide, is the opportunity to reclaim a community, to, to take that highway down, to reestablish it in an inclusive way that it adds on to the current residents in that community, not gentrifying them, not moving them now out, but making them a part of what that community will be without that highway there to reclaim what was taken from them in the 1960s. Thank you all. Okay. All right. So this is a question for the whole group. I want us all to imagine that um, we're a little further on in figuring out COVID and we've all gathered in person at a cocktail party and the first round's been poured. Um, what is one commonly held belief about cities that you encounter in your work that's, that's just wrong and that's, and that's an obstacle to, to inclusion? I, um, I'd love to hear from everyone on this, but why don't we start with Kate? Sure, um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And I think uh, in my case, in particular in Nashville, um, a common misperception is that everyone is experiencing the same growth and positivity and success and economic benefit to the growth of this city so fast because they're just not. We, um, like uh, both Liz and Sharon shared, we have um, uh, the same situation. I-40 came through and cut off North Nashville um, and it displaced 1400 people. It was, it was a thriving black neighborhood with three HBCUs and um, it's TSU, Fisk and Meharry Medical College. There were shops and restaurants and music clubs and Jimi Hendrix played there. And then this interstate came through and just wiped it out. And I think that area has struggled ever since. So first they had the redlining issue and then they had the I-40. And, you know, they're not benefiting from the growth of the city and people coming in and pushing them out and, you know, gentrification of certain neighborhoods. And it's easy to look at Nashville and think, wow, what an awesome city. And it is awesome in a lot of ways. And it's great. And there, there are certain areas that are just amazing. But there, there are people that are not coming along for the ride. And it, I think people overlook that really often. Yeah, I'm sensing some emerging themes here amongst this group. Carolyn, would you like to weigh in on this one? What's uh, your 
you know, out there doing this community organizing, you're working with activists. Um, what's a myth that you're constantly finding yourself having to bust? Yeah, I have to just jump on to Kate's uh, coattails there. It was a great point in terms of how we are being, we need to think differently about how we imagine progress and prosperity. And so, uh, you know, as, as Sharon made this point that earlier that we have a misunderstanding of what progress looks like. And historically, that has been bound up into these highways and into this idea of urban renewal, which we know as James Baldwin reminds us was, James Baldwin reminds us is about Negro removal or the fact that these roles really came through so many people's uh, communities. So we have a fundamental misunderstanding that progress uh, is shared equally, but also the tools of planning, the tools of policymakers can be beneficial to all when we know that that is absolutely, not only is it not true, but it, it, it demands new tools and new strategies for how we link economic prosperity and growth to targeted on the ground revitalization and restoration. We are still walking out uh, these lessons. And even though I sit in a planning department, a lot of the work that there remains to be done even in the academy is about undoing what we think we know. Uh, the, the, the reality is that highway economics as a field uh, that has been debunked, dismantled, there was a, a body of thought that was really driving so many of these decisions. And we, we do have an opportunity to not let just the business leaders or, or just the corporate interests drive what happens in our cities. We've got to make sure that people who are on the ground can have an opportunity to not only to, to take advantage of benefits, but actually be designing benefits, shared benefit agreements, be designing cooperative agreements, be, demand, be designing all of these ways that we're actually getting into bed with folks and designing uh, what those kind of policies and clawbacks look like. That's, that's the call and response. I think that's, that's before us. Yeah. Wow. So, so Deputy Mayor Owens, what does it look like in Syracuse? You know, um, and I, I, I come from a, a more rural setting, but I'm a city girl, been, been, been so for many, many years. And, and the one thing that you continue to see is the perception of cities and in Syracuse, Midside City being no exception, is that it is the personal use engine for individuals who come for their job, who come for their favorite restaurant, and they leave without and go back to the suburb, um, um, not understanding the full complexity and wondrous nature of our green space, of our neighborhoods that are so eclectic. Any particular one you go around, the fact that Syracuse is a uh, refugee resettlement community and just the complexity over the last uh, probably 20 years of complexity of culture that you can find here now because we open, uh, opened our arms to um, new Americans from all over this globe. And um, just the, um, I'm always the person in the room probably putting my foot in my mouth, defending this city and every city against that just perception of it is dangerous, it is this, it is that. Um, it is in a, um, a, a, a mixing bowl of amazing neighborhoods and green space and people, oh my goodness, and, and, and culture. And so combating those just antiquated, um, bigoted, racist, um, socioeconomic, um, culturally biased, um, all the isms that make this world, um, if we can get rid of all of them, a utopia, you find when people think of a city when they don't live in a city. <laughs> I, I can relate. And, and Liz, I would imagine that in your role working with data, at a department of trans at a state department of transportation, you're um, you're right there in the mix. Um, with people, maybe people see the same number, um, but uh, see different stories. How's this landing for you? It's so funny, and everything that everyone said resonates so much. And I know C Carolyn knows this so well because we're in the we're in the same town, and and especially Carolyn, who quite literally wrote the book on the anti highway movement in Boston, can appreciate that. You know that movement. And I, this is what I've learned from Carolyn's book, that movement wouldn't have happened if people from many different communities, many different types of, of perspectives were all coming together to 
see the same goal and see the same mm -hmm. the same outcome. And I think what we have in a in a in a region like Boston and a state like Massachusetts, one of the things that we need to help people do is find themselves in the data, even if that isn't uh -huh. data about their own town. We're very parochial in Massachusetts. We have 351 cities and towns. We don't really have counties. We don't have regional collaboration here. It's very hard for people to understand why something that happens in, in the, the next town matters to them. And that really dampens, that limits a lot of what we can do in transportation planning when we want to build a regional tran transit network, for example, and build bus lanes that cross municipal boundaries. It can be very, very challenging to get everybody on the same page. And so I think one of the things that we've been trying to do is activate and incentivize more regional cooperation between our cities and towns. You know, when we do corridor studies, when we do land use plans, when we talk about I-95, we're not just talking about one group of stakeholders. We're talking about people that that live and work and travel through the area. So, you know, everything everyone has said is so spot on in terms of making sure we're all sort of working towards the same goals. We all need to get on the same page and sort of appreciate where everyone's coming from and why why this all matters, you know. Yeah, I hear you on that. So one thing I'm noticing that everyone has in common is this is this belief that intentional intervention can yield positive change. So let's let's like let's head for let's head for some high ground here. What's un can, can folks share some encouraging things that have happened in your career um, as far as building inclusive cities? Anyone got to pick me up to share? <laughs> I have one that I can share. It's really quick. When I was a grad student at Northeastern, one of my projects was to go uh, working with a local community-based organization to go door-to-door -door surveying people. And, and traditionally, right, you build surveys that are as, as short as possible because you don't want to take up too much of people's time and they don't want to be bothered with all these questions. Well, our survey was about transportation and transportation challenges. We couldn't get people to stop talking to us about this mm -hmm. because everybody wants to tell you how terrible their commute is, how hard it is to get their kids to daycare or, or to after school or pick them up after school. It's sort of a universal thing that people can commiserate over. I know that sounds bad, but what it means is that people are engaged and they're actually, mm -hmm. if you bring people things and you ask for their help with building inclusive cities, they want to. The public wants to be a part of this process. And that's again why I was saying how important it is, you know, through a lot of our, our more recent planning efforts is to get out of the room and get away from the table because that is is priceless. We spend a lot of time modeling trans people's transportation behaviors at the expense of just going out and talking to them and asking them, you know, but when you do that, you're going to get a lot back. So that's one thing that's always been encouraging to me is, is just how engaged and how energized I became after talking with people about these very issues. Wow, I'm really struck by how that kind of echoes what Deputy Mayor Owens was sh sharing about what motivates her and uh, Carolyn's work uh, and, and, the, and the activists and communities that she works with and the model that Kate shared, uh, the, the Alliance Bernstein kind of like, uh, you know, like, uh, Kate, can you, what was that again? I'm, I'm just really struck. It was with observe, it. reflect, engage. So, you know, it, you have to take all three steps in order to effectively make an impact, I think, in a community. Otherwise, you're, you're skipping a key, a key part of, of um, you know, you've got to listen to what people have to say. You have to really take a minute and digest it. And then you have to act. All three are important. Tracy, I'd also like to add that uh, here in Syracuse, particularly with the I-81 project, specifically with it, um, not only did the, the erection of that highway decimate a community, but when it was built, the nerve that the people who were displaced didn't even get an opportunity to earn an income from building it. And so as we're rebuilding and reimagining what this um, community asset will be along the part of the poorest parts of our city, um, we are at the table with the DOT taking advantage of the SEP 14 renewal of that, pro of that program at the federal government to ensure that local people are hired on that job, that local people have the opportunity to be a part of building the future for themselves and their community. And so many times when we're talking about infrastructure, the, 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 we're talking about the design of it and the creation, but we're forgetting that it takes hands and people to build it. And, and this will be 
be a $2 billion project here that we want to ensure that the people who have been most affected by this highway generationally are the people who work on it. Right on. So um, to that end, one of the defining challenges of building inclusive cities is that in the United States, even as overall poverty has been declining, concentrated poverty has been getting worse. So the number of neighborhoods where there are really high shares of low-income households is, is getting worse. I'm interested to hear from folks in your work, are you encountering this? Why do you think it's happening? And what do you think we should do about it? You, you know, for me, you are underscoring there, Tracy, the need to have a, a real focused look at wealth, um, wealth extraction and wealth creation. We, we've all been in this very engaged discussion nationally and perhaps locally around the racial wealth gap. And I know here in Boston, our, our sites have been really set on this issue for, for quite a while um, since the, the Federal Reserve Bank here released the Color of Wealth Report in 2015, which was a really important study that helped us understand um, how people are doing and how they're not doing, not just based on their income or their wages, but this real issue about intergenerational wealth transfer and what that looks like. And so what I appreciate is the opportunity to think systemically about how people are doing. And your previous question, Tracy, about kind of what gives you a sense of, of hope. Uh, for me, it is kind of the way that we're shifting our sites to conversations that are much more systemic um, and intentional in nature. And, and want to just uh, appreciate uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Owen's comment earlier and apologize for addressing you by your first name, oh. uh, but really <laughs> appreciate um, just what it means to think very much about sort of the intentionality of systems colliding and systems exploding and not serving folks who need and deserve them most. If there's anything that we've learned in the aftermath of George, to George Floyd's murder, which is the need to really think systemically and structurally and hold our attention there. And it's definitely true in terms of poverty uh, reduction, but certainly what that means in terms of wealth distribution um, and shared wealth. <sighs> yeah. I mean, that immediately brings to mind, you know, I'm curious, you know, as folks are getting through like these past 18 months and everything that's been going on um, with the murder of George Floyd and the pandemic, um, how has your work been changing in in these recent months? Any any readouts to share that are that that feel significant? Every disparity that we know to exist, whether it be anecdotal or through data, had a giant magnifying glass on it. And we found ourselves, at least I know I did, over the course of the last 18 months, uh, addressing what was uh, tenfold, twentyfold disparity in, around food food inequities, around transportation issues, around, my goodness, the ability of um, broadband and internet accessibility to everyone when we had to remotely educate our children and children who I, I don't think that the story will be told for probably a couple decades from now, um, just how, how that remote work impacted so many of our children. Uh, and just to add to that, um, in, in Nashville specifically, uh, because we focus on education, we already had a literacy crisis um, in Nashville. Our third grade reading level scores, um, we only had 28% of our kids reading at grade level in third grade. And that metric is used to predict all kinds of other future success metrics. And, and we just got the scores back in um, from last year, and it went down to 20%. And so it, that pandemic um, has done some real damage, and I think it's going to take everybody because we've got to educate these young people. They just deserve to have access to learning. And so um, I just am very passionate about that, and it breaks my heart to see those numbers. Wow. And to that end, I mean, let's let's talk about what needs to be done. We're coming up on time. So I'd like to go around and just ask everyone, what is something that you think it's imperative be different in 10 years in order to move the needle on urban inclusion? 
uh, throw the playbook that Liz talked about in her side-by-side -side, um, um, illustrations about what urban planning needs to be about. Urban planning has to be fluid and has to be intentional and strategic and um, completely adherent to what the people who live and sleep and breathe and work in a particular community understand about their community. So uh, the playbook has to be completely thrown out, like uh, Liz talked about, to get throw out the table, tore the tear the door off the hinges and have very purposeful conversations about um, place-based transportation, housing, infrastructure. I totally agree. It's all linked. Transportation, education, food insecurity, um, all of that needs to be addressed at once and it needs to be private and public sector and people need to work together in order to make a plan that, that can act actually be executed. Yeah, I would say too, to, to follow on what Sharon and Kate and Carolyn have been saying is it's it's about people. I think we need to reorient ourselves from thinking about like, policy or infrastructure or fiscal stuff, you know, and we need to think what, like, it's all about people. Like we're all trying to help people live the best lives and communities let, be vibrant and healthy and safe. And, and so I think just stopping talking about everything except for people. <laughs> I'm, yeah, as I said, I'm a sociologist, so that's easy for me to say, <laughs> but, but um, I'd like, that's what I'd like to see. And I think everyone should read Carolyn's book. <laughs> Liz, you're fantastic. Well, let's, let's get that title. <laughs> Thank and, you uh, so let's much. Let's have our concluding remark. Oh, so Liz, I appreciate the, the shine and, and attention to this book of People Before Highways, which was certainly a labor of love. And, and in that process, I learned how important it is for us to listen to folks, as everyone has said, people who are on the ground, who've been living these realities, they absolutely have a very robust ideas about what the present and future can be. Um, and for planners, planners need to understand that that's, that's where the action is. And there's got to be a longer term arc of understanding time, literally, and a longer term understanding of time, both that's projecting into the future that includes us, and time that is rooted in an, an understanding of how people lived and sustained and thrived also in the past, because we, 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 we run the risk of not only repeating the mistakes of the past, but bringing in new violence to ourselves because we are not using the common sense of folks who, who are willing to tell us uh, what their experience is revealed and what we need to be building. So um, I've appreciated this conversation so much and just feel completely encouraged and energized to kind of head back into the classroom um, and, to, and to keep working. And we are all leaving with an action item, which is to get and read People Before Highways by Dr. Carolyn Crockett. So everyone has something they can do today, but we all also understand that we need to start working out working on those muscles so that we can tear those doors off those hinges. Thank yes. you for that, Deputy Mayor Owens. <laughs> Liz, Kate, thank you so much for your time today. This was just a wonderful convening and I really appreciate this energy. Let's all stay in touch. Thank you all. Thank this you. Wonderful.